Hey, Carol, it was kind of a shock to the system to turn the calendar over to October, wasn't it? Oh, yes, and you know what that means. Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year. All like that. Boom. Go into Hobby Lobby, and it's like little aisle for Halloween, tinier aisle for Thanksgiving, and huge aisles for Christmas. All at once. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know how to even talk about that. That's crazy. That is crazy. But we also need to give a shout out to the people of Florida. Oh my gosh, the devastation from Hurricane Ian. Horrible. Uh, it reminds all of us to breathe and take each day and enjoy what we have on this earth because you just never know. You never know, indeed. And now let's get going with this episode because you never know what we're going to have in this episode either. <laughs> Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. Way too many. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's go on to this week's episode. Good morning, Carol. How does your garden grow, and is the weather nice or what? So the garden grows well. The weather is beautiful. Um, I've been out in the garden. I picked a ton of peppers. Carol picked a peck of pickled peppers. No. <laughs> I uh, got all kinds of peppers. I'm going to freeze a bunch to use for winter cooking. I've done some weeding, some deadheading. I go out and I look and say, hey, is this flower going to self-sow all over and make a big mess? If so, I chop off its head and then move on to the next one. Huh, that's funny because in my garden, if it's going to sow a lot, I go, yay. But it'd be because it's so big. I enjoy those self-seeders a lot. Not everything. You don't like you don't like uh Rebecca Goldstrom. Rebecca. Yeah, but it doesn't just recede. That stupid stuff also goes by underground roots. But anyway, we have something to say about that later. Well tell me what's going on in your garden this week, this past week. I bought two varieties of viola. Yay. I'm making an influence on you, aren't I? No, I always buy viola. <laughs> But there was a new one at uh, Terracotta Nursery in Guthrie, and it's called Tiger Eye. And it's the cutest little thing, and I planted it right outside my window, right outside my door, where I work, so I can see it coming and going, because I'm writing a blog post about that. And then I also bought Penny Denim Jump Up, which is pretty, and then... I I want those. My little greenhouse only had pansies this year, so I might have to go on a little plant hunting expedition to find somebody that's got violas at a reasonable price. I saw some the you other know, day. Tiger Eye is so stinking cute. I'm going to send you a picture of it. Okay. Maybe we can put it on our newsletter. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So guess what else I did? I see it in the notes and I'm like, D, you said you were never growing that again. And look at that. You're growing that again. Garlic. I know. Don't. Don't trust me, people. I bought garlic. I bought Bavarian purple because it's a hard neck variety, and you can't, you know, you can't get those in the store. You can only get the one variety. So I, I'm going to put it in the potage. In fact, I'm going to plant that today. I also worked on Friday and mulched the front border. I bought, you know, I finished planting the pansies. I bought a few pumpkins, placed them by my front door because I don't care what Hobby Lobby says. I'm still in fall. I'm still in fall as well. And D, you were telling me earlier about where you got some of the little pumpkins. Oh, I forgot to mention it. Yes. When my daughter came over with Maddie, my little granddaughter on Friday night, Maddie had in her hands a little striped pumpkin. And she said, for you, Gigi. And the funny story, there's a funny story behind that pumpkin. Megan is not really a gardener. Um, she might be someday. But last year she had a pumpkin on her porch. And she, when it you know, started to rot, she just kicked it off behind her <laughs> ornamental grass. Uh-huh. And it composted and grew. So she had pumpkins. About midsummer, I was like, you realize you have a pumpkin growing out your front door. And she goes, I know. I think I'm going to see what happens. So you know what? She might become a gardener yet. She might, but the the old kick it to the compost, uh, let it grow method, that works for some people. 
<laughs> Especially if you put it behind your ornamental grass. Think about it. It's like it fed the grass. It's pretty funny. And then you also have the notes about you watching butterflies, and we're going to talk about that later too. Yes, we are. There's butterflies outside my window right now. Very nice. So I'm going to hit us off with a quote. As long as autumn lasts, I shall not have the hands, the canvas, and colors enough to paint the beautiful things I see. Vincent Van Gogh. I, I wish mm-hmm. I was a painter. And like I said to you earlier, you could become a painter if you just want to take the time. I guess. But that's not our topic. <laughs> Let's no. talk about annual and tropical flowers that we might try to overwinter. We made a big list without much trouble at all. Right. Pelargoniums, coleus, impatiens, begonias, caladiums, and then you wrote and why, which made me laugh. Um, you just wrote two articles about for Family Hand Me Man about coleus. I did. Which First one is, is coleus a perennial? Which it's a tropical. Which we know that you can you can complete that article with one word. No. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> not going there with you. Okay, and so you asked me, have I ever taken my pelargoniums out of their pots and put them in a paper bag to overwinter? No, and all of the new data says don't do that. It says you know overwinter them by cuttings or overwinter the actual plants in pots. I mean, they're not. Why this ever got started, I have no idea. Um, Because all it does is it sort of puts them in a dormant state, but it robs that mother plant of energy all winter long because they're not a bulb. And so don't don't do that with your pelargonium. There's just people that swear by that, though. I know there are people that swear by a lot of things. (laughs) Epsom salt. Yeah. Baking (laughs) soda. (laughs) Yeah. So um, we don't swear by those. Anyway, the nice thing about pelargoniums is you can take cuttings if you want to. And you can regrow from cuttings or you can give those to a friend and then keep the mother plant because you have to cut the plants back to bring them indoors because otherwise they get all, you know, floppy because they don't have as much sunlight. Right, right. right. A lot of times you can cause them to bloom again in the winter time if you cut them back right and then you get to enjoy them in winter. Yeah. Which is nice. They won't bloom quite as much as in the summertime, but my goal, and I overwintered a pelargonium last year because it had pretty leaves. My goal is just to get it through the winter without dying Mm -hmm. completely. And I know it's going to drop leaves, you know, and you just cut it back. And that's just part of it. It is just part of it. You might need some supplemental light to get them to bloom in the winter, some diffused light. But here's the deal. My pelargoniums don't bloom in the summer anyway because it gets too hot here. If you have a mild summer in Oklahoma, um, they'll bloom okay, but a lot of years they don't. They bloom in spring and fall. So I kind of enjoy that wintertime flush because I get a flush in the winter. So really? It's different than where you It live. is different. Mm-hmm. Plus you were saying you have scented geraniums, which might be worth over in wintering because they're not the easiest things to find sometime. No, you have to buy them from that lady who lives out in San Francisco. I mean, there are a few other places that have them too, but she's the geranium lady. And actually, we're going to link to a an article in American Gardener. I'll go find it. And it's about American Gardener magazine. It's all about her nursery and how she became the pelargonium lady. The pelargonium princess? She is. She knows more about them than anybody. And if you want scented ones, and the cool thing is, is that when you order from her, you literally write her an email and tell her what you're going to order. She ships it to you, and then you write her a check. That's that's low tech these days. Yeah, it is. So that's method okay, number so one. Your ideas. Well, method number one was take cuttings and create a new plant, and that works for coleus. It works for pelargoniums. It works if you have begonias or impatiens, and you just think that there's you really just need to keep it. That's one way to do it. The other one is just clean up the pot, cut that plant back, bring it inside, and hope it makes it. And in respect to that, we were talking earlier before we went on um, about my friend Denise. Hi, Denise. She listens to us every week. And nice. she said that <laughs> she said that she has some ants in her pots that she's taking into the greenhouse. And you had a really good idea for her. Well, the big idea is to get a five-gallon bucket, fill it with water, and then plunge that pot down in there and really soak it. And the ants should come swimming out and they'll drown. And I might do that. 
And if I see a bunch of ants come out, great. Then I'll pull that pot back out, empty the water, and redo that a couple of times. And I think that'll safely get rid of all those ants. Yeah, without any kind of pesticide. So that's number two. And then you could also let it go dormant in the pot and put it in a cold basement or garage where it won't freeze. Um, okay, I don't, I don't have a cold basement or garage where it doesn't freeze. I, I don't live in a house from 1892. I don't either. I, you know, my garage is well insulated. You know, it gets cold. If it gets down to the 20s, it's, it's in the 60s. It doesn't have an event from the furnace or anything. I'd have to put it in the crawl space, and I, I kind of think the crawl space doesn't freeze because then my pipes would freeze. So, but I'm just mm-hmm. there's no plant that I care about that much. Me neither, because my garage does freeze. And one year I put all of you know because I like to force bulbs, so I put a bunch of bulbs in the refrigerator because it doesn't get cold until like December or January enough, right? Right. But one time I put them on glass in the refrigerator and all of them it, we had a really bad freeze come through and i lost a bunch of my bulb forcing vases um so i learned that lesson there's a lot of lessons in gardening they're very expensive yes. and embarrassing there there are those. there are mm-hmm. i have those. so neither one so of us then, do that no we don't put our stuff in a cold basement or garage. My basement's, I have a basement, which people think is unusual in Oklahoma. It is, but I have a walkout basement, but it's warm, so I don't do that. I either. do have one plant that I let go dormant in a pot, but I leave it outside under a tarp. Which one's that? It's got mint growing in it. <laughs> okay, well, you can't kill mint very easy if you try, so I can see that. And I have a couple of roses that are in big pots, and I put them on the east side of my house, up against the house, uh-huh. and they do fine. Cool. The thing about pots is it's just two, it's two zones colder than your zone. If you can remember that, it's, it's a good thing to remember. And then the last one you put up was dig up the roots, etc., and that's like caladiums, elephant ears, etc. So I will pull my elephant ears out of my pond in the next couple of weeks, and I will put them in my greenhouse because I like to watch them grow in the winter. They're pretty. Yeah, and I, I have a couple of elephant ears this year, and so I might pull those up and just put them in a bag and stick them in the garage, and, you know, if they rot, they rot. It's not going to be the end of the world. But our most favorite method <laughs> for how to get how to overwinter our less than hardy plants, <laughs> it's not really a method. No. <laughs> We just let it go, like the movie Frozen, let it go, let it go, and then buy new next spring. Yeah, Yeah, I do on a lot of things. Now, I was going to say, I actually, because I can't always find faults for vein, and it's a great butterfly plant, sometimes I take cuttings of it and bring it inside. I take cuttings of several salvias that are unusual salvias, um, Van Hootie types, they bloom late in the season. I think they're really pretty, but they don't sell well in Oklahoma at the nursery because they don't look like anything in the spring. No. And don't you take cuttings from your African blue basil? I take cuttings from African blue basil because it's been hard to find um, anywhere. I found some a couple of years ago on Etsy, and you have to take, and this is, people ask me about this a lot. I'm glad you brought it up. African blue basil is a mix between two different basils and it does not produce seed, which is why it produces nectar all summer long. And right now the honeybees are losing their minds over it. Yeah. I have some because remember I was at a greenhouse earlier in the spring with my garden club and I texted you and says, is it African blue basil that you're all freaked on? Because I was looking at it in a flat. And Mm -hmm. so I bought some and uh, then Everybody in the garden club's going, what you got? Because it didn't look like much. I says, African blue basil, I suggest you buy it. Yeah, and it makes a nice big clump here. I don't know what it grows like in Indiana. It's three feet tall in the pot. It's a big old plant. People ask me if you can eat it, and I'm like, well, you can, but I wouldn't eat it. I'd eat a Genovese-type basil because they're better. So most things we just let go of, there are certain things that you just can't find every year, and so those are the ones that I... First, take cuttings of. Yep. And actually, I have an article coming out in American Gardener about taking soft cuttings. Ooh, so that'll be exciting to I see. I don't know when it comes out, though. I'll let people know when it does. Shall I do the next quote? Please do. This is Fall Leaves by Emily Bronte. 
Fall leaves fall, die, flowers away, lengthen night and shorten day. Every leaf speaks bliss to me, fluttering from the autumn tree. I shall write when wreaths of snow blossom where the rose should grow. I shall sing when night's decay ushers in a drearier day. That one wasn't easy. I know, but you did I pick it or did you pick it? Yes, you did. No. I didn't mean to trip you up. It's, it's very lovely. Oh, now I know why I bought garlic. Because we said we were going to talk about it. (laughs) I couldn't for the life of me figure out why I bought garlic again. Okay, so we're going to talk about garlic. Go for it. So the reason you grow garlic is exactly what you said earlier. You can get better varieties with better flavors. The hard neck varieties for those of us in colder climates especially. And so that is why you grow garlic. It is totally different than that little thing you buy in the store that, for heaven's sakes, a lot of the garlic that's sold at the grocery store is imported from China. From China. From China. Which is crazy. It is. Right? Because, because why are we shipping garlic from China where we don't even know what they put on it? Because they have totally different rules than we do. Yeah, have. like no rules. So, like, no rules. So... Hardneck garlic is also grown in Oklahoma. We can grow both types. And there are ver- tons of varieties of softneck and tons of varieties of hardneck. And you should buy something that you've always wanted to taste that is different. And right now is the time to buy yep. and the time to plant. And you get it in the ground and then you harvest it next, like, June is when I usually harvest them. Mine would be the end of June. And I might, I might wait a week or two to plant it. Well, no, I'd plant it now. I'd plant it now, yeah. But the thing is... Because you know what? It's going to be in the 40s in Oklahoma. In fact, it was in the 40s in some parts of Oklahoma right now, Well, let's, we'll this morning. We'll talk about weather at the end, Dee. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So the soft neck, the um, soft neck does not require a cold period in order to grow, and the hard neck does. So that's one of the reasons, too, and hard neck will better survive the winters than the soft neck varieties. Although I don't think the soft neck would actually die. No, probably not. I don't know. I mean, I just know why we can grow both here. And the big, and it's not hard. But once you, after you, okay, first of all, we should say plant only the big cloves. Right. Don't plant the little bitty ones because you'll get them smaller. Um, what's the word for it? <laughs> smaller Bulb. thing of garlic. Yeah, bulb, I guess. So, anyway, well, let's let's one. back up. When you buy ga- garlic to plant, they're going to send you a big old bulb, which is made up of individual cloves. So you ter- you carefully break off all the cloves, and every clove you plant is going to give you a new bulb. So you know exactly what okay, your harvest will be. That just seems really obvious to me, but okay, because if you cook it all, you know that garlic is cloves. I know that, but some people like they get that big bulb and they don't know they should oh, take they off. The whole bulb. You should take off the individual cloves. Every clove is going to create a new bulb, which is made of multiple right. cloves. Right. That's the whole idea. And you'll get quite a bit. One thing to remember about when you do harvest your hard neck garlic, it does not last as long as soft neck. No. Which is another reason that the commercial garlic is almost all soft neck because it stays, you know, it stays viable a lot longer. So go on and use it. Once it dries, go on and use it pretty fast because it just doesn't last that long. Yeah. I, Maybe four months. Yeah. I wrote in here that the garlic they sell in the grocery store is bred to be a variety that they can toss around and it'll last forever on the grocery store shelf. And so. No telling how old it is. No telling right? how so old it is. the garlic you grow does taste better and you can harvest a few of the scapes in the spring don't harvest too many of them because if you do that then you take away energy from the bulb because you want it to die back and put energy back into your bulb that's right and the scape as we all know is the the little flower bud that's formed it has a right. like a little pig's tail a little curly cue and if you have garlic chives you can just eat those instead of the scapes because they taste like the same thing and garlic chives is trying to take over your garden anyway. So um, what else do we want to say about garlic? Oh, I want to say that after, okay, so you're going to plant it, and then it's going to come up in early spring because it comes up pretty early. Yep. That's when I fertilize mine. And the way I fertilize it is I just put on a nice 
inch and a half layer of compost on top of it. There you go. How do you do yours? I, well, I've only grown it a few times, but I would do the same thing when it comes up. Just add a little layer of compost. Uh, okay. Kind of a plant it, forget it, and then dig it up in late June, early July here, but it, a little earlier. When the, they, they have like when the second set of leaves or whatever has died back, then you should dig it up. They got some, some rules about that. But, okay. It's not hard to grow. We should say that. It's not also, hard to grow. It's pretty much pest free because pests do not like garlic. No, no. Pests and vampires do not like garlic. <laughs> so we'll put an affiliate link to garlic on botanical interest. They sell some. They sell a lot of organic uh, garlic too. So we'll include that link. Cool. All right. On to the next quote. Go for it. Happiness is in the quiet, ordinary things. A table, a chair, a book with a paper knife stuck between the pages, and the petal falling from the rose, and the light flickering as we sit silent. Virginia Woolf, from her book, The Waves. And we chose that because it, we're talking about what's on the bookshelf, and you get to say what's on the bookshelf. I don't know that that quote relates to the bookshelf at all. It talks about books, oh. ordinary things, a book with a paper knife stuck between the pages. So on the bookshelf, I put my own book, The Halloween Hair, my new children's book that's coming out on October the 4th. It's cute. Thank you. Cute. My nephew, You're welcome. Uh, Ty J. Hayden, did all the illustrations, and his mama listens to this podcast every week, too. Because I'll say something like, well, we said on the podcast, she says, Carol, you know I listen to that podcast every week, don't you? <laughs> I'm always surprised when people tell me they listen. I know. Oh, okay. And then sometimes I'm thinking. And yet we know people listen because we get stats, and they've really been good lately. But I'm always surprised when somebody says, on the podcast you said. I'm like, really, did we? So the Halloween hair, I wrote a story back in 2008 on my blog about a, a rabbit that comes out on Halloween night looking for leftover Easter candy. And so Mm -hmm. through the years, I wrote a few more posts about it. And then uh, I guess last year, I decided that that would be a nice second children's book to go along with the Christmas Cottontail, uh, Mm because the Halloween hair is mentioned briefly in the Christmas Cottontail. So I got my nephew to do the illustrations, and we have uh, published that book. We've self-published it again. And so it officially comes out tomorrow. But do I have copies, D? No, not yet. No. Not yet. No, you had to send me a PDF. I'd send you a PDF. So it is available on bookshop.org and on Amazon. And someday, Dee, I will actually have physical copies here that I can sign. <laughs> that's okay. And then I can send them <laughs> off to people. But that's our book, The Halloween Hair. Yay! Carol published another book. Good job, Carol. <laughs> Thank you. So do you think it'll Where's start a new tradition of people throwing candy out in their lawns for Halloween? It almost always rains in Oklahoma on Halloween, and I was like, ooh. Um, I don't know. It might. Oh, Who we'll knows? see. Do that next quote. One reason to love autumn is that it strings you along. Autumn doesn't hit all at once. There is a gradual cadence to the denouement that demands continual vigilance if you want to miss a beat. And that's by Tova Martin, The Garden in Every Sense and Season. I think she, I think it actually is if you don't want to miss a beat. I think it's you don't. Because, I think we yeah, missed up. I was like, it has to have don't. Um, anyway, Tova Martin is one of our favorite authors, and I love The Garden in Every Sense and Season. It's one of my favorite books that she ever wrote. Lovely to get out and just peruse it. in any season. It's very lovely. Mm-hmm. She's a good writer. So, our dirt is hilarious. You sent me this text and... <laughs> A text this morning that says, watch this video. Your wish is my command, D. <laughs> I put snort behind it. Yeah, I did see I that. snort laughed. <laughs> so it's a, it's a skit on SNL, and I thought that SNL would never, ever be mentioned on our gardening podcast no. for real. Because <laughs> we don't watch it all the time. And on top of that, um, I just... <laughs> Just don't. I can't imagine any time that they would come in and do something that would make me mention them. But they did it. They did. They did it. They did. Uh, they did a skit on the spotted lanternfly, and that was the funniest thing I've I've watched in a while. It was pretty funny. And so, whatever our dirt was before, we wiped it out because we said we need to alert everybody that. Right as a, never mind. 
It's just too funny. It is funny, and we're not going to tell you about it. You've got to go look at it. We'll link to it in our show notes and in our um, newsletter. But we also are going to link to some real info from Cornell University and some of the other universities. I think Mount Cuba is another one I went and looked. Yeah. Um, the Spotted Lantern Farm, Lanternfly, is really serious. It's a very serious pest. But this guy playing the spotted lantern fly was the funniest thing I've seen in a long time. It is. It is. And unexpected. And I don't even know how you found it because it never, SNL skits never come across my radar anymore. Uh, actually, it was part of uh, CBS This Morning. It came, they, they linked to that little section of it. Oh, okay. Where he's talking about him flying in hot. Because he's on the news part, and the news part's the funniest part of SNL anyway. And the guy says, whoa, lantern, spotted lantern fly, you're flying in hot. And that guy comes in. Oh, my gosh, so funny. Y'all got to go watch it. That is it. funny. You want to do the next quote? Sure. Yesterday, I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I am wise, so I am changing myself. And that is by Rumi. We do a lot of quotes from Rumi over the years. We do? That's and the I, first I remember. Yeah. No, we've done several. It's not like he's Hal Borland or something. (laughs) No, he's not Hal Borland, and he doesn't ever talk about gardening, really. But it is true about, you know, rabbit holes are what make us change ourselves, part of it, right? Yeah. We become educated about our own deal. So do you want me to talk about mine first, or do you want to talk about yours? Well, yours actually relates to gardening. (laughs) Oh, okay. I haven't read yours yet. So I was listening to a webinar Um, put through by Monarch Joint Venture, and they mentioned they have a a bunch of other webinars. Boy, do they ever. And so Carol linked to all of them for us, which is nice. And they're very, very helpful. Not everyone um, applies to stuff I'm interested in, but a lot of them do. And it's fascinating stuff, and I can watch them during the winter time. And then um, Carol says that she ran across a nice article from Purdue. I did, about where the monarchs in Indiana and uh, what was really interesting about it was they had a link to a gigantic list of native flowers, shrubs, and trees that you can plant in your garden for pollinators. And it's specific to Indiana, but I would bet it it's a pretty wide range of plants that probably goes all the way to Oklahoma and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. But I thought it was a great list and a decent article, so we'll link to that as well. And we'll also link to my blog post again that I wrote about monarchs um, because it did go a little bit viral and it was very helpful to some people. And I got a lot of comments where people were asking me about what they should plant. And I referred them to both Monarch Joint Venture, um, Journey North, and some of the other groups that work. Monarch Watch is another one. And they're all really great groups that work very hard. And one of the confusions about monarchs right now in my state, which I'm sure they are in Indiana too, um, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I don't have any more milkweed. Because that's one of the things, there was a big push to get people to plant milkweed, right? right? right. Which we do need to plant throughout the United States, especially on the monarch path. But right now, monarchs don't need milkweed because they're in their um, diapause, is it diapause? Yeah, diapause, where they don't don't mate right now because they're headed to Mexico. So what they need right now are nectar plants, easily accessible nectar plants. Right. And that's what Carol is talking about. So it's a very... um, it's it's a like all things to do with gardening when you're trying to help a species it's complicated but here's the good news the good news is we're seeing more monarchs on this particular if you look at journey north there's more this year so what we're doing is working that's good planting more milkweed planting nectar plants and they're working with agricultural systems and highway systems and lots of other things it also helps other pollinators too Monarchs are not the only migrating butterfly. For example, painted ladies and American painted ladies. Right, I see those. Also migrate. And they are being helped right now too. And you're also helping bumblebees, carpenter bees, hoverflies, lots of things. That is true. that's a cool thing. One last thing. That's my rabbit hole. That is pretty good. One last thing I'll link to is, and I think I, I sent you a link where, remember a long time ago I talked about that guy who makes little figurines out of acorns. He calls them bee yes, acorns. Yes, the acorn guy. That was funny. He has a video where he did a bee corn with monarchs, and it's it's so cute. 
A lot of patience. It is cute. A lot of patience. So, I. So, what did you rabbit hole this well, week? Well, I had a busy week, so I barely had time for rabbit holes. But I had time to read the third installment of the Thursday Murder Club ugh, Thursday Murder Club series by Richard Osman. This one's called The Bullet That Missed. I don't know if you've read any of these, but these. I've read the first one, and I'm in the second one. I just I started reading it on my trip, and then when I got back, my son wanted me to read something else, so I read it. But so. th- it's those four old people at that retirement home, and the Thursday Murder Club, they in like England. to, in England, they like to solve unsolved mysteries and murders and stuff, and then they end up getting involved in current day murders and kind of drive the police They're nuts. Funny. They are hilarious. So that one was very good, and I actually checked it out from the library, And I was pleasantly surprised because on the Kindle, I'm like, they're saying it'll be months before you get that lady. But I must have also specified the hard copy because it popped up that I had it waiting for me at the library last week. So I hustled down there and got it. Then as soon as I was done reading it, knowing how popular it was, I was a good citizen, good library citizen, and I've already returned it. (laughs) Good for you. So... But you also wrote about two other cozy mystery series that you're reading. Yeah, so I've re- um, there's not much gardening in that, the bullet that missed, except I will yeah. say it doesn't give anything away. They're, of course, digging in a garden to find the body. Of course they are because they're English. <laughs> exactly. But one of, our lis- one of our listeners had recommended another cozy mystery series that's the English Cottage Garden Mysteries, and I read the first one called Deadhead and Buried. <laughs> and then it was pretty good. I mean, I, I kind of figured out about halfway through, I was pretty sure I knew who'd done it, and I was right. Uh-huh. Um, and then the second one, I have to see if I can get a copy, Silent Bud Deadly. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and so the the problem is, D. uh-oh. Well, this author also writes another series called The Oxford Tea Room Mysteries. But you know, from my Aunt Demity summer, when I see a series in order, I I have to read them all in order, and so mm-hmm. that'll be a wintertime thing. I'll I'll start diving into those in the wintertime. I'm busy now. I'm really busy. Me too. So, shall we go on to our garden commission? Yes. Okay, so I'm planting the last three shrubs and one tree today. I could not decide where to put that tree, but I think I figured in it out. the ground. And thanks for that. I'm also planting the last six day lilies. Thank goodness I'm almost done with that. And then I'm pulling everything else into the greenhouse for winter. One thing I noticed, which I haven't told you about, I had more giant swallowtails this year cool. than I ever had before. Cool. You want to know why? I know why. Why? Their host plant are citrus trees. Oh, and you have citrus and trees. And I have three... I have three or four citrus trees. So it dawned on me, you know, about midsummer. I was like, oh, that's why I have so many. I mean, I had tons. And also my trees get kind of eaten, but they're okay. They don't hurt them that bad. And then, yeah, that's it. That's all I'm doing this week. Well, you have reminded me that I need to, I have two shrubs that I got as trial plants. I need to put those into the Mm -hmm. ground. I will do that this week. But this first half of October, I'm um, too involved in Garden Comms virtual conference taking place October twelfth, yes, twelfth to the fifteenth, yeah. and I got a ton of stuff to do for that. So I have lowered my expectations for outside in the garden, which means um, I'm probably doing more than anybody else. But I am going to pick the dried green beans because you know I'm saving seeds for my green beans, and they're ready to be picked. And then I think I'm going to try to spend about an hour a day just going out there and deadheading and pulling up weeds and just a little bit of a time. And by the way, Dee, we are flirting with frost next Friday. Oh, I, that, I, I don't know why, but that stresses me out. Well, I know why, because if we were flirting with frost, I'd be in big trouble. But right now, we're pretty darn good, and it's just, butterflies are still flying. It's so just those two days. It's just Friday and Saturday, but there's a yeah, predict it takes is two days. Predict- predicted low of 34 and 35, I think. But it'll change. It'll change. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that you have plenty of time to get done what you need to get done. I'll be fine. And we'll see if you show us show up next week, listeners. You'll find out. Did Carol have frost or not? 
And thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review that helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share our podcast with your gardening friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And subscribe to our new Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at Substack.com, also linked to in our show notes. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.